This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Welcome to Global Business Africa. We'll be giving you insight into Africa's business and financial markets. I'm Uchiro Koronkwa, coming to you from Kenya's capital, Nairobi. Let's start with a look at the markets. Now, emerging market stocks were up today. That's amid expectations that some of the world's major central banks will be cutting interest rates soon. We saw on the continent South Africa's JSE closing in the green in line with most global stocks. And that's after reports that the US and China may soon resolve the, the prolonged trade war. We saw banks and financials topping the gainers list today. In Nigeria, the old share climbed over 1% on the day with large cap stocks like Dangote Cement uh, and M. MTN topping the gainers list. Now also coming up on the show. Incoming UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson vows that Britain will leave the EU by October 31st. Chinese President Xi Jinping signed several agreements with the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi. And a simple tweet leads to a major investment for this South African ceramics business. Well, let's start off today's show in Britain. Hardline Brexiteer Boris Johnson has won the Conservative Party leadership contest, setting him up to be the UK's new Prime Minister. Now, the former Mayor of London will soon have the responsibility of steering the UK through its messy divorce with the European Union. Johnson cruised through the leadership contest that began last month with victory over his opponent, Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt. He entered the race as the clear front runner and easily got the backing of Conservative members of Parliament, as well as approximately a 160,000 party voters, who of course ultimately got to choose the country's next leader. Well, let's get more insight into Johnson's win. We are joined now by Jamie Owen. He joins us in Westminster. Great to have you on the show, Jamie. Now, we saw the pound up against all major peers today after that announcement. Uh, but, of course, Johnson, he does kick off uh, his term with a number of resignations, uh, a country in crisis, an e economy that, of course, is weakening, uh, escalating tensions in the Gulf, and, of course, a government uh, on the brink of breaking apart. So, Jamie, what what will be his priorities as he starts off his term? Well, you said it. I mean, that's a pretty heavy intray for anyone coming into any job in the world. I mean, it sounds absolutely mind boggling. Uh, during his uh, campaign for the leadership, understandably, Boris Johnson, as you do in these election campaigns, offered all things to all people. and. Uh, we heard promises uh, that uh, Britain would have uh, more spending on education, more spending on teachers. We would see more police officers. Perhaps we might see tax cuts for the middle classes. But obviously, Boris Johnson's priority has to be Brexit. Brexit brought him to power. Brexit lost his predecessor her job. So Brexit has to be his priority. He has to deliver it. Let's listen in now to uh, his acceptance speech after he was formally named the new leader of the Conservative Party. We are going to energise the country. We're going to get Brexit done on October the 31st. We're going to take advantage of all the opportunities that it will bring in a new spirit of can-do. And we are once again going to believe in ourselves and what we can achieve. And like some slumbering giant, we are going to rise and ping off the guy ropes of self-doubt and negativity with better education, better infrastructure, more police, fantastic full fibre broadband sprouting in every household. We are going to unite this amazing country. Well, of course, Jamie, uh, we know Johnson has just about 100 days to negotiate uh, a new Brexit deal with the EU. And already some inside the party are, are vowing to fight his policy, which, of course, uh, is basically leaving the EU with or without uh, an agreement. What does the road ahead look like for him over these next 100 days? You know, the road ahead for him over the next 100 days is pretty daunting. I mean, let me just talk you through it. That building behind me, the House of Commons, has a number of times rejected a no-deal Brexit. 
This House of Commons behind is essentially a Remain a Parliament. So, new Prime Minister, big deal. At the end of the day, power and change in the UK lies with this House of Commons. And they say there isn't going to be a no-deal Brexit, which Boris Johnson has made the absolute centrepiece of his election campaign. What are the other things on the road ahead? Well, quite simply, the EU has said, you've seen the deal, this is the deal, there is no further negotiation or renegotiation on the deal. I mean, if that wasn't enough to deal with, Boris Johnson is also dealing with enormous critics in his own party. One politician said earlier today that you expect to find knives in your back when you get to the top of politics in the UK. Well, Boris Johnson has knives in his back and he also has knives in his front. So the next hundred days is going to be pretty difficult, whoever you are. Mm. Well, we do know that U.S. President Donald Trump, he congratulated uh, Johnson today on his victory. He's, of course, praised him as a friend in the past. Does this win for Johnson mean a smoothening of relations with the United States and suddenly other allies of the U.K.? Well, your, your words are absolutely well chosen because smoothing out is very necessary just at the moment. Uh, diplomatic relations between uh, the UK and the US need a major reset. You will remember just a few days ago uh, that huge diplomatic spat uh, when the uh, former UK ambassador to Washington, Kim Darroch, uh, had his private memos leaked so that everybody in the UK was aware exactly of uh, his rather some might say undiplomatic analysis of uh, President Trump and the people around him. So that inevitably soured relations, uh, albeit perhaps on a rather temporary basis. So Britain's biggest trading partner, the United States, is of course critical to the Boris Johnson administration. That reset is hugely important. However, just as Donald Trump uh, is a divisive figure in the US and around the world, so too is Boris Johnson. And Johnson will have to gauge very carefully how closely he gets to President Trump. Mm. Now, of course, Johnson just won uh, the prime minister's seat, but already some conservatives and uh, those who clearly dislike uh, him and his ideals, they believe a general election is inevitable. What are the chances uh, that will happen? I think you're right. I mean, the reality is new prime minister, but something doesn't change here. And it's the sums in this building behind me. In order to make changes in the UK, it's the House of Commons that has to agree change. And the sums in the House of Commons are not in Boris Johnson's favour. So one way out of this mathematical impasse, this political logjam, is to call a general election. Now, that's fraught with all sorts of difficulties. The thing about calling elections is you never know precisely what the outcome may be. You might remember that Boris Johnson's predecessor, Theresa May, also called an election for precisely those reasons, to try and improve her hand, uh, as it were, in the House of Commons. And that went terribly wrong. It left her in an even more weak position than she was before. So people here are talking about the possibility of a general election, possibly at the end of September or perhaps in spring. There's an old convention in the UK that you tend not to have elections in the winter. People are cold, wet, miserable uh, and it's dark. So by and large the UK tends to go to general elections uh, uh, in the summer, uh, the early autumn and the spring. So that's being talked about here. Anyway, let's uh, find out a bit more about this man who perhaps might lead us into a general election, the new Prime Minister, Boris Johnson. And I should warn you that uh, my film contains some flash photography. It's taken a long time for Boris Johnson to get into 10 Downing Street. Getting to the top of British politics is no mean feat. If Boris Johnson has cultivated anything, it's a reputation for clowning and buffoonery. But his charisma and his way with words appeals to many voters. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Thank you. Boris has won because everyone is sick and tired of career politicians, beige people who took us into that terrible financial crisis. Now we've got someone, we know who they are, they call a spade a spade, and that's the kind of person we want leading us.
Childhood friends recall his appearance at school drama performances where, having failed to learn his part, he'd run across the stage from pillar to pillar where he'd stuck the script. Getting a laugh by not preparing is one of the criticisms levelled against him by critics here at Westminster. Boris Johnson started his career as a journalist and was fired from his first job for making up a quote. He reported on the European Union from Brussels and was caught exaggerating and in some cases simply inventing stories. After moving into politics, Boris Johnson became London mayor by winning over voters who didn't ordinarily vote for the Conservatives. His tenure as mayor saw the city host the Olympics and the introduction of its popular bicycle hire scheme, though both had been signed off before he took office. Gitto Harry was at Oxford University with Mr Johnson and worked for him when he was mayor. He is hugely intelligent, enormously charismatic, quite offbeat. He breaks the rules, he does the kind of things that people don't expect politicians, or certainly didn't in the old days, to do. He speaks what's on his mind. Johnson's first chance to become Prime Minister came and went after the Brexit referendum. He was pronounced unfit for office by a political friend turned competitor. Former Prime Minister Theresa May then appointed Boris Johnson as Foreign Secretary. Critics say his inattention to detail in that job compounded the detention of a British woman imprisoned in Iran, where she remains. The episode didn't win him friends in the Foreign Office. Would you like to see him as Prime Minister? He would not be my first choice, no. Second choice? He may not even be in the top two. Boris Johnson has become Britain's Prime Minister by campaigning as the outsider. Yet he is the ultimate insider, a millionaire who went to the elite school Eton as well as Oxford University. Mr Johnson's first job as leader will be to take his country out of the EU. Failure to deliver Brexit could add his name to the long list of Conservative leaders who have been brought down by party divisions over Europe. A new Prime Minister doesn't mean the old problems will disappear. Jamie Owen, CGTN, Westminster. Well, thank you, Jamie, for your insights. Of course, you summed it up pretty well uh, there. Of course, that was Jamie Owen joining us there in Westminster. Well, let's shift focus now and take a look at our corporate headlines for the day. Now, the former head of Tanzania's state oil company is being reinstated by President John Magufuli. This comes after the ex executive was suspended over claims of abuse of office. Together with four other Tanzania Petroleum Development Corporation executives, James Mataragio was suspended in August 2016 by the company's board. And South Africa's High Court has granted Vedanta Resources an urgent interim order. The latest verdict blocks the liquidation of the firm's Konkola copper mines uh, in Zambia. The Indian-owned mining firm is currently locked in a dispute with Africa's second largest copper producer over its decision to appoint a liquidator to wind up Konkola's operations. And British Airways has gone to court to seek an injunction to prevent its pilots from striking. The latest move comes, comes after the airline's pilots voted by an overwhelming majority to strike rather than accept its proposed pay increase. Now, British Airways says the planned walkout will cause maximum disruption, costing it up to 50 million US dollars a day. And finally, US President Donald Trump has agreed at a meeting with the heads of top tech firms to make a timely decision on requests by U.S. firms to sell to Huawei. The latest meeting between Trump and the tech leaders comes as America continues to shift its policy regarding the Chinese giant, which of course has been thrust into the center of a U.S.-China trade war. And that's a look at our corporate headlines. Well, we're heading into a short break now. Here's a look at what's still to come. Kenya's finance minister, Henry Rotich, gets just over $140,000 bail over corruption charges. And Zimbabwe hikes its fuel prices for a second time in just a week.
The world economy as we know it is about to change. Global business reports highlight emerging markets, developing countries, and dynamic sectors worldwide. We feature top analysts and newsmakers to provide perspectives on every facet of business. From an on-the-ground perspective, we provide you with balanced and objective assessments. Fast, sharp, and insightful. Global Business, only on CGTN. Every story starts out like this. Beyond the rush of the numbers, there's always a more fundamental question. What happened? Who has been affected? When market moving decisions are made, who's responsible and why? Let's get some reaction on ground. Joining us in Johannesburg is Hello, Nairobi. This well, is how all stories begin. See how they end. Only on Global Business. There's more to this place than just glorious landscapes. There's more to it than just, say, Table Mountain or glorious, endless salt flats. There's more to it than countries that are home to some of the deepest minds in the world. There is so much more to this place, even if it is home to some of the finest diamonds on the planet. It is the sheer diversity of the people who call South Africa home and the relentless drive to make it a better place that make it so special. And we know that because this too is home. No one knows South Africa like we do. CGTN, see the difference. Africa is the nexus of enterprise, and global business will tell you why it matters. From the mega investment projects to multi-billion dollar mergers and acquisitions. Africa today collects, just in terms of revenues from taxes alone, $545 billion a year. If you take 10% of that and you devote it to the energy sector, problem solved. All this on Global Business, weekdays at this time on CGTN. Welcome back. Now, a Kenyan court has granted Finance Minister Henry Rotich and his principal secretary a cash bail of about 145,000 US dollars each. Now, this comes after the two were arraigned at law courts on Tuesday over various corruption offenses. Rotich and 27 other officials are accused of financial misconduct and conspiracy to defraud taxpayers in a multi-million dollar dam project. He makes history as the first sitting Kenyan cabinet, cabinet secretary to be arrested and hurled to court in relation to graft charges. And moving on now, the rise in global consumer purchasing power and digital innovation has fueled record growth in the hospitality sector in Africa. Now, this has been attributed to the increase in hotel investments that has buoyed revenues for countries such as Kenya. The country has seen an increase in the number of properties lining up for a space in the market with an expected 1,800 rooms added over the next two years. That's according to PwC. Uh, the international hotel brands with about 2,600 rooms will enter the market, accounting for about a 14% increase in hotel capacity. Well, let's delve further into Kenya's hospitality and tourism sector. We're joined by Hassanin Nurani. He is the founder and MD of Pride Inn Group here in Kenya. Very great to have you in the studio, Thank uh, you. sir. Now, let's talk about the growth we're seeing in Kenya's tourism sector, estimated uh, at about 7% uh, over the next uh, five years. That, of course, has been spurred on uh, by increasing investment, especially in the hotel industry. You're one of the fastest growing uh, hotel groups in the country. 
country. What are the trends that we're seeing inspiring uh, this increased investment in the tourism sector? So thank you very much. Um, so first and foremost, we must understand that uh, if you look at Kenya in general or even within Africa, there is a big rise of the millennials. We all know millennials are people who are born within, between 1980 and the year 2000. So there's that huge growth in the millennials. And these are people who are not only looking for brands, but they're looking for experiences within any particular country. Mm. And this experiences that they're looking for is what is shaping up the hospitality trends and the investments. Secondly, uh, you can also look at it this way, that there's that increasing, uh, the, all these young millennials have a very high disposable income because these are people who are working in some very fine corporate companies. They have some fine packages and they're looking to experience different products and services. Mm -hmm. So this is only looking at within Kenya or within Africa itself, but also looking at the general international trend. Africa is virgin, Africa is pure. The entire experience that Kenya offers, if you look at Kenya, we have, the, we have one of the finest beach. We have bush safaris, you know, we have wildlife safaris. So all this contributing is increasing the appetite for hospitality investments within Kenya and within Africa in general. Mm. Now, as a result of this, we're seeing competition really picking up in Kenya's hotel industry. I'm sure you would agree with me. Yes. We've seen huge names, core hotels, uh, coming to open new branches or new uh, hotels in, in the city. Marriott, Best Western, uh, pouring funds to expand. You as well uh, are looking to expand. Give us a sense of what competition is like in the sector, in Kenya's hotel sector right now. Um, okay, generally, first and foremost, we must understand that with these international brands coming into Kenya, most importantly, they are giving us the global recognition, so which is a fantastic thing to have because they are putting Kenya on the map. You know, they have their own marketing activities that happen there. They have their own, uh, they have their own advertising activities. But if you're looking at within competition, yes, we see quite a number of large number of hotels coming up, but they all have their own different experiences. Right. If you compare Pride Inn Hotels, which is a local brand, homegrown. we uh, which is a homegrown brand, yes, mm. and we understand the local markets thoroughly well. We are able to offer right, right what exactly our visitors expect in terms of the local feel and touch, right. which is where you see that, uh, yes, as much as competition is intense, but then everyone has their own knowledge and expertise. Secondly, within the local market, within the, as the local homegrown brands, uh, we are also trying to shape up to make sure that we're offering the feel and be able to compete with the international brands. Right. So this all in all itself is having, so every particular brand has got its own market segment that they offer. Mm. And uh, secondly, also looking at it is uh, in terms of generally people these days, when they go abroad, they want to have the feel of the local touch. And that's, a, that's the reason why you see Airbnb, you know, these technology driven platforms are growing so large. And Airbnb is particularly home, you know, particular people want to have homestays which is homestays particularly offer the local touch. Mm -hmm. So we have, and then uh, we, with the increased demand of people coming into Kenya, and especially uh, the MICE market, which is the meetings, incentives, congresses, and events, that, that increased demand that is coming into Kenya, the air connectivity, it is bringing in the numbers, which is where, yes, as much as competition is there, but I think everyone is sharing their own market segments. Right, and, 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 and of course that makes, leads to my next question, which is about international standards. Is Kenya uh, matching up to international standards? We're seeing internationally a lot of new trends uh, in terms of the guest experience, uh, both in terms of technology, as you mentioned, in terms of sustainability uh, as well. So how are you keeping up to those international standards? So first and foremost, uh, with international standards, every as a local homegrown brand is Pride Inn, first and foremost, we, we, we always ensure that as, okay, I'll talk about Pride Inn in general. Right. We have, we understand what the local businessman wants, what the international businessman wants. We know that we have focused on some, on our, on, our, on our brand promises, which is the six brand promises, which is a good night's sleep, relaxed shower, hot breakfast, business and Wi-Fi, maximum security. Mm -hmm. We understand that the international traveler is looking for such experiences and we are continuously investing within our hotels and to make sure that uh, we are keeping up with the international trends when it comes to Wi-Fi. You know, right. people, people these days need Wi-Fi and they want to post the experiences immediately on every social media sites. So we ensure that we are always keeping up with the high speeds of Wi-Fi. In terms of the room designs, we understand how exactly a guest wants to have the room experience. And with our new hotels that we are now coming up, it, it, we offer, we, we actually ensure that the room designs are suited to, uh, to, are suited to match him. Right. But in our recent hotel that we recently built, that is, which is the Pride in Paradise Beach Resort, what we realized is that people are looking 
people are looking at more experiences within a particular facility. Right. So when people come in for meetings in the, uh, to our resort, they want to bring in with families. People are becoming more and more busier. Businessmen and businesswomen are becoming more busier. They don't have time for their families. So the best thing to do is to combine business and leisure combined, which is what we have launched a concept known as Blazure. And what we have done is we have actually put in a safari-themed aqua park along with the convention center right. and then a world-class spa. So what we're trying to do is we are offering everyone in the family something to do and yet after, after, and, and yet after the day has finished and the business meetings have finished, people are able to come and sit down, mm -hmm. families are able to sit down and still enjoy a good family time. Right, right. So now, this is how it's happening, yeah. Yeah, now as we mentioned, you're a homegrown company uh, and you're looking to expand further into Kenya, yes, that's right. uh, add new properties to your portfolio. Give us a sense of your expansion plan going forward uh, and s also how confident uh, are you in Kenya's economic and political landscape uh, going forward? So first, for the uh, business. For the business. Mm. So first and foremost, as uh, Pride in, we have a very aggressive expansion plan. We want to establish, we want to establish a, a hotel in every major county within Kenya. That's our first goal that we want to do. What we realize is that, um, you know, creating facilities is the first step towards creating a demand for a particular county. And this is something that I would encourage all the governors within the country to look at, to be able to offer incentives to hospitality investors like right. ourselves. Mm. And especially if you're looking at the various local counties, a lot of the international brands would want to invest in the first tier cities. You know, it is homegrown brands like ourselves as Pride In, we are the ones who are looking at the second tier cities. If we are looking at establishing, example, a hotel like what we have done in, in, in Mombasa, like the Pride In Paradise Beach Resort, if you're able to establish a large convention center in, in Kisumu, for instance, or in Eldred, that itself prompts people to get into Kisumu Eldred for meetings. This is what we observed in Mombasa in 2014 when we invested in Mombasa. Mombasa was on its knees, or the cost was its knees. You know, tourism was, was on its very low. Mm. And when we announced the investment, people were actually wondering why were we doing the investment. But it was at that time we realized that Mombasa did not have convention center facilities. There were no meetings being held. If you compare that with the Dubai, you know, with London, a lot of Dubai and London was being kept busy because of the large exhibitions, the large conferences, the large conventions. And the first step towards even leisure tourism is also business tourism because right. if there's a business meeting, you're going to travel for a business meeting. So this is what we have done and, and this is what we plan to expand. We, we call this the pleasure model where we want to bring in the, the actual business and leisure model within the various major counties. Obviously, the expansion doesn't stop there. We are looking at... The, uh, we are looking at the region, but then right. we're also looking at going East and Central African also. Okay, so expanding for uh, beyond yes, Kenya right. as well. Well, thank you. Unfortunately, we do have to leave it there, but thank you so much for joining us uh, in the studio. Of course, that was Has Hasnan uh, Nurani, is the founder and MD of Pride in a Group. Well, let's shift our focus now to Zimbabwe. The country has hiked its fuel prices for the second time in a week. The country is currently battling fuel shortages, which are disrupting operations for companies. Its inflation is at its highest level at the moment, stoking fears it could be headed back to an economically traumatic past. With the details, here, CGTN's Farai Mwakutuya. Year-on-year -year inflation rose to a 10-year high 175% in June. It's expected to soar higher as the local currency continues its downward slide and as other factors exert pressure on the economy. Electricity prices must go up very dramatically, more than double, I would guess. Fuel prices will continue to go up. Um, food prices will rise in the second half of the year because of the drought because of the need to import uh, maize and wheat and so on. Um, and there's also a catch-up in terms of wages um, and in terms of uh, some service costs like state education, state hospitals and so on, which, which haven't been adjusted in line with inflation and which will have to be. Uh, on the forecast some of us make, we think inflation will reach perhaps 190-200% by by September, and then fall in October, the last quarter. The reduction is expected as government, fiscal and monetary reforms start to take effect, although the jury is still out on whether the boldest measure, reintroducing the Zimbabwe dollar, will work. Well, again, in theory it should, but in, many, in practice, again, because of the lack of trust, because people have no confidence in the local currency, they've been burned twice. Uh, first uh, in the early 2000s uh, with hyperinflation and now again. Uh, they've lost their savings, they've lost their pensions, 
they've lost their bank deposits or the bank deposits are now worth a fraction of what they were uh, six months or a year ago. And so there's no trust. Secondly, if you want to uh, bring down inflation, it really doesn't make sense to exchange a strong currency, the US dollar, for a very weak currency, because that just adds to inflation. No one knows what will happen after the third quarter. So they'll just have to watch and wait, something many here have become used to. Farai Mwakutuya, CGTN, Harare, Zimbabwe. Meanwhile, the South African citrus industry is still recovering from a crippling one-month-long go-slow strike by Coega port workers near the eastern Cape city of Port Elizabeth. Here's CGTN's Angelo Coppola with the details. The Kukha port authorities took over a month to resolve the situation by obtaining a court interdict forcing workers to increase productivity. They also suspended some of the ringleaders. The reports that we have from the port now is that it's actually operating uh, well. Um, they're back up to 25 crane, gross crane moves per hour. They were down below 10 uh, during the height of the problem. So things are returning to normal. Despite the interdict, the ghost load damaged the citrus sector at the height of their export season. The Eastern Cape growers tell me that it's costing in between 50 and 100 million rand a week. Uh, and this issue has really been going on for more than a month now. So we're talking about 200 million to 400 million rand. Uh, in terms of, of that uh, impact, a lot of it is around the reputational damage of the South African citrus industry uh, in that we've always been known as a country that can export fruit reliably and timelessly uh, into the markets. In a desperate attempt to circumvent the Eastern Cape port, farmers made a plan, but the damage was done. The growers in the Eastern Cape are also diverting their, their fruit down to Cape Town and up to Durban, and that's costing between 5 and 10 rand uh, per carton. So really uh, uh, big financial implications and longer term reputational damage for the industry. Durban looked like a viable option, but it had its own problems. We had a lot of absenteeism. We also experienced the high levels of uh, equipment failure. But in the past 24 hours, that has improved uh, tremendously. As a result, the performance has also shot high. The South African citrus growers know the Durban port very well. Durban takes 70%, 60 to 70% of our fruit, um, and, and it has been operating uh, fairly efficiently. Not, not as efficiently as we'd like it to, if we look at the norms, the, the world norms. The South African citrus industry adds around $1.5 billion to South Africa's GDP on an annual basis and employs around 100,000 people. It's a growing sector, but it does need support. We've got massive volumes coming on board in the next three years which will add to that number, another 6 billion rand, another 25,000 jobs. But we need markets and we need the logistics situation sorted out uh, in order to gain that benefit. I'm Angelo Coppola for CGTN at City Deep, Johannesburg, South Africa. Now in Senegal, IT experts, decision makers and business leaders have assembled in Dakar for a two-day cybersecurity forum. The event focuses, focuses on how to develop regional cooperation on cybersecurity and support for digital development in Africa. Here is more on that story. About 1,500 participants from 15 countries are in attendance at the 6th Dakar Security Forum. The theme of this year's event is cybersecurity and cyber resilience. What are the strategies for the private sector? The first innovation made for this sixth edition is the involvement of defense and security forces in the forum. And beyond that, there is also the organization of the first cybersecurity competition in West Africa. In November 2018, Dakar established the Regional Center for Cybersecurity. The center aims to offer training in the fight against terrorism, computer hacking, and crime in the digital space. The school will be based in Dakar at the National School of Administration before moving to Diem Nadio. Senegal has put in place a system to defend all forms of attack. We have a strategy that is driven by the Presidency of the Republic in collaboration with all actors and with all sectors of the state. You know very well that today, whenever a country is considered unsafe in the field of cybersecurity, there is a risk that investors will not actually come to this country. 
because now cybersecurity is one of the pillars, it is a main requirement for a strong investment. This is part of Senegal's new national cybersecurity strategy, as it works to curb terror funding and propaganda. Backed by France, it will have a regional vocational role in helping other countries in West Africa achieve a common goal. Daniela Pearson, CGTN. You're watching Global Business Africa. Let's take a quick break now. Coming up. President Xi Jinping signed several agreements with the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi while in China. And the United Arab Emirates tries out an unlikely helping hand for a new source of fuel. Business in Africa is at the crossroads. We celebrate those who are adopting and thriving despite the challenges, from grassroots to big businesses. Global Business takes you along for the ride as we track the making of a giant. Only on CGTN. With a dedicated and diverse team of anchors, CGTN now brings Africa to the palm of your hand. I'm sitting in a Caribe in the heart of Nairobi, which is bustling. From everyday heroes to the continent's most powerful figures, we bring their voices to you. We haven't changed. And this is something most of us are very excited about. We bring you news that's changing perspectives. News that brings Africa to the world. CGTN. See the difference. How will your world change today? What happens here? What happens there? Or what you make happen for yourself? If it matters to you, it matters to us too. Your stories are the stories that need to be told. Africa Live. Find your voice. is my kind of city. That's because when I'm here, I feel like I'm back home in Lagos or Abidjan, which are two of the major cities I grew up in. See, business in Africa is high After risk. about a decade covering business news on the continent, I've learned it's all about the high risk, but also the high returns and the high energy. You simply have to adjust in order to keep pace. When I started out as a journalist, my dream was to open people's minds to the different perspectives. From the CEO in the boardroom to the trader out in the street, we all have different stories. From Accra to Addis Ababa, from Cairo to Cape Town. And I wouldn't have it any other way. Here at CGTN, we realize that Africa is on the move. And it's moving fast, but we're moving right along with it. I'm Uchiro Koronkwa, and I'm a business anchor and reporter at CGTN. Now, on the international front, China and the United Arab Emirates have signed over a dozen cooperation agreements, including ones involving their militaries and the Belt and Road Initiative. The signing took place after President Xi Jinping held talks with the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi in China. Here's CGTN's Wu Gyokshu reporting from the Great Hall of the People. A ceremony with 21 gun salutes. Chinese President Xi Jinping welcomed the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, to Beijing on Monday.
China and the UAE are celebrating the 35th anniversary of diplomatic relations this year. Last July, President Xi became the first Chinese president to visit the UAE in 29 years. A comprehensive strategic partnership was announced during that trip. President Xi says since then, bilateral relations have maintained overall high-quality development. And during this meeting, the two sides will release a joint declaration on strengthening that partnership. The crown prince is visiting China for the fourth time. He says deepening the comprehensive strategic partnership will be the biggest priority of the UAE's diplomacy, and that no matter what happens in the world, the UAE will be China's best strategic partner. The two sides signed 16 cooperative agreements after their talks. Top on the list was one to boost military cooperation. Others focused on agriculture, the environment, nuclear energy, and artificial intelligence, as well as cooperation under the Belt and Road Initiative. There was also a memorandum of understanding on listing the Chinese language into the UAE's primary school courses. Prior to this visit, ambassadors from both countries say China and the UAE's relationship is the strongest it's ever been. This visit expected to enhance their political, military, commercial, cultural, people-to-people, -people, and technological cooperation across the board. Also on the Crown Prince's agenda is a joint economic summit Monday afternoon. Wu Guoxiu, CGTN, Beijing. Meanwhile, APEC is celebrating its 30th anniversary this year. It has made lots of achievements in trade and investment facilitation in the Asia-Pacific region. But now, as the world is coming to a crossroads of globalization, how can the economic, economic Forum continue its mission? And what will China's role be? Well, my co colleague Cheng Lei interviewed Matthias Frank. He's APEC senior officials meeting chair, who of course is responsible for preparation of this November's APEC Economic Leaders Meeting in Chile. So the APEC Summit takes place in Chile in four months. What do you expect China's role to be in this year's Chilean Summit? China is, is a very important player in, in APEC. It's a very important friend, a very important trade partner for Chile. Uh, more than a third of our trade goes with, uh, to, uh, with China. We are seeing a growing flow of, of Chinese uh, investment into, into Chile. Uh, including into the wine se into the wine sector and fisheries in mine in the lithium uh, exploration and production. So, but we want more investment for China. No, we want more technology. Um, we are in the process of, of uh, tendering for the for the next generation of, of mobile networks, the 5G. So, so China is one of the the, the important competitors in the market. Um, we have always been a very open country, open economy. So in that sense, everybody can compete in, 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 the, in the market. So we are looking forward to the competition for the next 5G technology in, in Chile. Tell us about the conversations you've been having here in Hangzhou at the APEC China CEO Summit. What sort of messages are you getting? What sort of investment interest are you seeing? For the main takeaway for me, back to, to, to Chile uh, and for, for what is APEC related, is, is a strong commitment of, of China, um, of Chinese authorities, of the, China, of the Chinese business sector, um, on the need of op open trade, uh, liberal, liberal economic regimes. Um, globalization is very important for, for, for Chinese companies, although the internal market is, is very big. It's huge, actually, uh, for, for investors and companies to, to prosper in China. But they're all, they all looking beyond that. You know, they all globalize networks, globalize uh, operations. The digital um, economy um, favors that you know, in terms of you get the technology, you get the possibility to, to do things um, not, notwithstanding where you are located. You know, and that's, that's very important. So, so I get this message about, about the importance of APEC, about the importance of trade liberalization, of open free markets, of predictable rules, the importance of WTO for, 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 for economies like China and Chile as well. So, so that's a very strong message that, that, that I get back. And I think that that's also um, in terms of uncertainties and trade frictions. Uh, we were just talking about that in, in, in the ABAC meetings. Um, it's important that that kind of very signals from, from, from China. So how does that message of liberalization counter the fears about more trade frictions? So, so, so there is a, a sentiment that globalization is here. We need to have more open markets. We need to facilitate trade. Um, certainly trade tensions uh, are there. Uh, it's in some way, they are um, 
I don't want to say polluting, but in some, some way they, they are outside yeah. of our, 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 our discussions in APEC. APEC is not the forum to solve those disputes, to solve those tensions. We, we, are not, we are not a broker, we are not a, a tribunal or a judge, but, but certainly, and it's not a negotiating body, but certainly what's happening outside in, in, some, in, in certain way has a lot of influence on what we can do and not do in, in APEC. So any positive signs, and, and we are now listening and reading for some positive sign, signal between China and the United States, um, that certainly will help to, uh, to a very positive outcome in December, uh, sorry, in November for the leaders of it. And moving on now, what do you get if you mix camels and a cement a plant? Well, based on an initiative in the United Arab Emirates, it could result in a potential new fuel source. Here's Jacob Greaves reporting. This could be the new face of the UAE's drive to reduce waste. Camels, or rather their excrement, being used in cement production. And it's all being pioneered in the northern emirate of Ras Al Khaimah. The thinking behind the initiative is to make better use of what was once largely a waste product destined for landfill. And it's fair to say it's fairly plentiful in these parts. Each one of these camels can produce between 8 to 15 kilograms of manure a day. And it's estimated to be around 10,000 such camels in the emirate alone. After being bagged up on farms like this, the excrement is taken to a nearby cement factory for blending with coal to power the plant's boiler. The government-run scheme began with a local waste management agency, but cement producers could see the financial gains. In a cement plant, 45% of their cost is energy, you know, where they're paying for the coal. For us, right now, we're not charging them for it because I'm just offsetting the transportation costs. It costs me just as much to haul it to the landfill as it does to haul it up to them. So my costs are the same. But I am having this uh, cost avoidance of landfilling something forever and having to take care of it forever. So at the same time, what we agreed in the MOU is that um, we would share our costs because it also costs them extra to process the camel waste. After some trial and error, the Gulf Cement Company created a blend that allows the cement oven to burn at the all-important 1,400 degrees Celsius. That's around one part dung to nine parts coal. Since May last year, the factory has been using 50 tonnes of camel manure a day. But there's also a sense of UAE tradition thrown into the mix. We hear from our grandfathers and grandmothers that there were some kind of of manures, it was utilized in that time as energy, and they burn it to get uh, some to warm the things, to uh, even to cook. And uh, but we, we are not thinking that we will utilize the camel, the camel manure for the cement factories. The impact on this factory's emissions are relatively small. Coal is still king. It does mean they're using less of the fossil fuel, swapping some coal shipped from South Africa for locally made dung. But crucially, the scheme is part of an ambitious government goal to divert 75% of all waste from landfill by 2021. With that target in mind, there's plans to boost camel excrement collection and expand to other cement factories. And that could be just the beginning. In their bid to reduce landfill, the Waste Management Agency have dubbed this the low-hanging fruit. Jacob Greaves, CGTN in Ras Al Khaimah. Well, on that note, let's take a look at how commodities perform today. Gold prices slipping to a near one-week low as we saw the dollar strengthen on the back of a deal on the extending the debt limit in the U.S. Meanwhile, oil prices slipping to about $63 per barrel today. Traders say we are seeing, con seeing concerns uh, that rising tensions in the Middle East will escalate and hit oil supplies starting to fade for now. Well, let's take a quick break. Here's a look at what's still to come. A simple tweet leads to a major investment for this South African ceramics business. And herds of animals migrate from Tanzania's Serengeti National Park into Kenya. You don't want to miss this. Do stay tuned. Images may appear to be identical, but looks can be deceiving. The difference is not always obvious. 
it has to be discovered. There are always different sides to a story. We put the focus on the details. To see more, to understand better. See GTN. See the difference. You don't find the stories of North Africa by sitting on the sidelines. No one else will take you where we can in North Africa. And no one else will show you what it's all about. CGTN, see the difference. In South Africa, a young entrepreneur has managed to catch the eye of investors, and that's after tweeting about his business. Mduduzi Matsane runs a ceramics manufacturing business at a derelict industrial park in Hammanskral, just outside Pretoria. Now, the $200,000 investment will help Matsane ramp up, ramp up production and more than quadruple his workforce. Let's take a look at his story. My name is Mtutuzi Matane. I am a ceramic manufacturer from Hamskra. I started ceramics when I was still young because my father is a potter. I think I was still five. Growing up in Hamskra, there's a lot of um, poverty involved. Uh, there's a lot of drug abuse with the Nyaope and all these things. I started off um, volunteering at an old age home where they offered me a place where I could make my ceramics. And then I saw opportunities in the Sadek region that there are not a lot of ceramic manufacturers. And then I decided to venture into it. I took all my savings, sold my car, and then just decided to take the plunge into this factory. I've been running this for the past three years. I employ 35 people. We manufacture all types of tableware, plates, cups, casseroles, ovenware, and um, designer and um, handmade um, ceramic products. We saw him do posting his uh, work on Twitter and show him videos and decided to come to the factory to see what he does. I was blown away by what he is doing here with other young people and decided to challenge uh, uh, my Twitter colleagues to invest uh, two and a half million rands for a 49% equity and then he'll hold 51%. But we, we know that there might be further need for investment. We don't see this as a small business that's going to remain small. We see great opportunity to uh, supply in the continent and supply in the world. The largest demands for our products are in the cities. For us to move those products on time, make sure, sure that people get their orders on time, it became a very big challenge. That's why Mr. CV decided I'm going to go into this and I'm going to assist you. And now we're developing all these things. My plan is that um, we want to create our own retail brand, Le Creuset and all these other big international brands. That's the direction that we're taking to make a South African brand that is of international standards. It's not just about me, but how we can also assist other people in the process and create the necessary jobs needed. Because Hamans Kral and a lot of areas around here are poverty stricken. And moving on, the wildebeest migration is one of the seven new wonders of the world. Over two million animals migrate from the Serengeti National Park in Tanzania to Kenya during July through to October. Well, the huge herds of wildebeest have now made it into the Mara Triangle and the spectacle of the Great Migration is underway. The vultures have started swarming and the lions and crocodiles are preparing for their next meal as the herds thunder through the plains in search of fresh green grass. Welcome to the Mara Triangle in Kenya, where we are in amongst the migration of wildebeest. My name is Steve, joined by Jandre on camera, and how fantastic is this? We've been waiting for hours for it to kick off, and now the dust and the pressure has finally built up to a point where the 
wildebeest have finally decided it's time to cross. It is the middle of the day and it is hot. We've been watching these wildebeest building on the other side of the bank and I think soon a couple more of the chutes are going to open as the wildebeest descend from the Mara Conservancy on that side. And there are hundreds of thousands of wildebeest on either side of the banks at the moment. Oh, those guys jumping. There's some jumping going on. There's some very inaccessible, oh, look at that. Some very inaccessible places that they choose to go down. And that all is derived from the pressure that comes from behind. You see all those wildebeest coming from the back. Horns, bodies, the press. But once it starts, all those that are massing at the back, some of them who've been turning around to head back in the other direction, they all suddenly hear the commotion and they all turn and increase the pressure. Look at that. Much more convenient for them coming down there on the right-hand side. There's a third one to the right of it that they were using the other day. If we get all three of these chutes open, it will be spectacular. It's just been un unbelievable how many there are and still for there to be thousands here at this one point trying to cross again is just remarkable. When one goes they all go and they try to make sure they're in the middle, try to make sure it's not them who gets picked out. So often you'll see when they get down to the water's edge that they actually jump, especially if they're in the front, they jump to try and clear whatever crocodile might be waiting right there at the water's edge. And still, they mount at the back more and more and more, attracted to the noises, the sounds. Well, before we go, here's a quick look at currencies today. Now, we did see gains by the dollar weakening developing world currency. South Africa's rand, though a little weaker against the dollar, it did firm up against the pound as, of course, markets waited to see who will be the next prime minister of the UK. Meanwhile, Kenya's shilling also weakening against the dollar, especially after the finance minister and, of course, other senior government officials were charged in court with offences related to corruption and fraud. Well, that's it for this edition of Global Business Africa. Remember, you can send your feedback to the contacts on your screen. You can also follow us on our various digital media platforms. From me, Uche Okonkwo, and the rest of the team, thanks for watching.